even if the terrible and tragic reports about what has happened and is still happening in areas dominated by our enemies are really to be believed, even if day after day we receive lists of the names of comrades, of beloved friends whose commitments to an ideal ensure their death at the hands of the traitors, do not, I beg you, I entreat you, do not imitate their behavior, meet their cruelty with your pity, meet their savagery with your mercy, meet their excesses of the enemy with your generous benevolence, do not imitate them, do not imitate them, be better than them in your moral conduct, be better than them in your generosity. Good morning to everyone, this is the Spanish Civil War. In this channel and for the next three years, we will follow week by week the Spanish Civil War, its battles and the Holocaust that it provoked. Today it's 9th of August 1936. Three weeks ago, a coup led by a group of Spanish generals threw the country into fratricide war that is already raging across the country. But before going to the fray again, this week we have to take a look at what happened in the international stage. As Wilhelm Canaris, chief of the Abwehr, the German secret service, visited Rome the fourth in order to coordinate the German and Italian help to Franco. As Willy pointed out using naval German documents, the conversations between Canaris and Roata set the basis of what tomorrow will become the Pact of Steel. This recognition of Franco that this week has been accepted in the Junta de Defensa Nacional with voice and vote will give him a preeminent role among his colleagues that won't stop glowing. Also because this week, the 5th of August, he decides to gamble with the victory convoy. Since that day, the airlift had transported 1,500 troops to Spain. In a single day, the victory convoy scored more than 10 planes and under the vigilance of the Deutschland and the Admiral Scherf brought 3,000 trained soldiers to Spain. The Republican Navy, even if superior in paper, was caught by surprise and just a couple of destroyers threatened the convoy but were repelled by discord aircrafts. Since this day, even if no more big convoys were planned, the airlift will start bringing 500 men a day. So, as promised, here comes the first major airlift in history. So, every war has its faces. We can remember the Battle of the Frontiers or the Race to the Sea of the First World War. This initial period of the Spanish Civil War is often referred to as the War of Columns. In fact, we've mentioned already the anarchist column from Barcelona, Mola's columns in the north, the Galician ones, and the ones that were wreaking havoc in the south of Spain. This week, the situation in the south gets dire for the Republic as three columns starts their march towards Madrid. General Mola's definitive plan for the coup consisted in racing to the capital from the north, the south and the east. As the coup failed in Valencia, there were no troops coming from the east. To worsen the situation, the troops coming from the north had been divided in order to block the branch border, and the rest stalled at Guadarrama, out of ammunition. The main punch had to come from the south, where the army of Africa was continuously arriving. Therefore, the campaign of Extremadura started. The obvious and fastest route to reach Madrid was not through Extremadura, but it was also a route through mountains terrain, easy to defend, and it was the one the Republic thought the rebels might choose. So Franco decided to reach the capital via Merida, an old Roman town and Extremadura. He also decided to split his 8,000th strong force in three columns in order to cover more terrain, taking every village they could and overwhelming every resistance they found. If the atrocities committed until now the shootings were already appeasing, now there was in the field a colonial army used to the worst we can imagine. The first column under Asensio Cabanillas departed last Sunday and covered 50 miles in two days. 
The fifth, it smashed a Republican force at Santos de Maimona, suffering four kills against 250. The seventh, it bypassed Villafranca and reached Almendralejo, where he found some trouble to secure the city. This episode is known as the Battle of Almendralejo. As soon as the rebels arrived, 28 right-wing prisoners were murdered. Then a short and bloody battle issued. The militias were no match for the well-trained African army that easily outflanked or enveloped them. Some of the defenders managed to retreat to the church. Here you can see a photo of the church today, after its restoration, cause the remaining militia turned the church into a fortress that will resist until the next week. Following the departure of Asensio, the 3rd of August, a column under Castejón left Sevilla and reached Zafra the 7th, shooting 40 civilians. The same day, the third column under Eli Rolando de Tella left for Madrid. Even if the forces were heading north, the cleansing of Andalusia will continue under Capo's rule and the columns like the ones of Carranza and Captain Luis Toro Buiza. In Lord del Rio, in reprisal for 90 right is killed, the columns killed between 600 and 1,000 people. Other villages will fall under their hands and follow the same fate. The fourth Granada cemetery caretaker is sent to the asylum. He had become mad. During the entire war, more than 5,000 people will get shot in the city, most of them in the cemetery wall. On the north, another column is assembled this week in Galicia. After one of the previously sent columns, the Jairos column, is stopped at Biluir. They ask for reinforcements and the new columns join them. With the fresh reinforcement plus two airplanes from León and the cruiser Almirante Cervera, the rebels break the defenders' lines and will enter Luarca the 8th. On the Basque front, we've seen last week how the major rebel column has been stopped at Renteria. This week, the southern columns advance in order to take Tolosa and therefore the Orio Valley. The scattered Republican defenses are not able to stop the advancing rebels, even if they delay them a bit. When two national columns join their forces under Cayuela and La Torre, the fall of Tolosa becomes just a matter of time. Also this week, not so far from the capital, the first chapter of the Battle of Tihuenza starts. The city, northwest of Madrid, has been reinforced by two columns of militiamen that arrived the 25th and 26th of July. After their arrival, they murdered the bishop of the city and all the suspicious of riding sympathies. This week, though, a group of rebels will try to take the city on the assault, but will utterly fail. The battle for the city will last for two more months. The Republicans are also preparing their own offensives, or at least the CCMA in Barcelona is doing so. In order to prepare an amphibious landing to bring back the whole of the Balearic Archipelago and the Republican Dominion, the 2nd of August they disembark in Ibiza and the 7th in Formentera thus preparing the way for the capture of Mallorca, the biggest island. Why that different colors on the map, you may ask? Well, we are used to maps of the Civil War that clearly differentiate the rebel and the republican side. But they do it like if there were or was some kind of unity beyond the idea of defeating the enemy. From the beginning. And it was not like this. During the next days, we'll see how the rebel side gets a central political unity. Meanwhile, the Republic will struggle for months to get it, as the state melted away, and in some places a revolution was going on. With the different colors, we would like to show the different main actors and how their progression towards unity was. That is not something new in Spain's history. We can remember how during the independence war, the different juntas acted almost independently against the French. So, we can see that in the rebel side we started the war with three focus, the African focus under Franco, the southern focus under Capo de Llano, and the northern focus under Cabanellas and Mola, the director. Until the end of the month, when an overall commander will be chosen by the rebels, guess who? They acted more like allies than like a united front. For example, Capo de Llano will end his infamous speeches with a Viva la República and the notes of the Riego's anthem, and he will also refuse the pledge of Franco to avoid killing General Campins, that instead of obeying Capo, put himself under Franco's command. We have to consider that there were lots of different political actors inside the rebel side, 
phalangist, monarchist, carlist, the army itself. On the Republican side, we used even more colors and we could even use all the chromatic circle. In the north, light green, Euskaleria, except for Alaba and Navarra that sided with the rebels, almost isolated, with a conservative, nationalistic and Catholic government that seemed to have not that much in common with the republic they supported. There, as we pointed out, a couple of weeks ago, the repression against the church was almost non-existent. Being cut out of the Republic, they had to defend themselves, creating the Eusko Gudarostea, the Basque Army. In fact, this week, Avpetia's military command convoked the militias of the PNV, the National Basque Party, in order to start organizing this force. They seized the gold reserve they had and acted like a de facto government of the region. Also in the north, and also isolated from the Republic, we have Asturias, where the Hicos of 1934 revolution could still be heard. A popular front committee in Samas with Socialist Dominion and a war committee with Anarchist Dominion in Oviedo will merge, spoiler alert, at the end of this month into the Consejo Soberano de Asturias y León to control this territory. Continuing in the northwest of Spain and between Asturias and the Basque country lies Cantabria, inviolate, a mountainous and very religious region that the rebels thought will easily fall under hands. This did not happen, and the 27th of July, the Popular Front designed a war committee that had the task to control the region. In Catalonia, as we've said before, anarchists took control of the region and therefore were supported by companies Catalan nationalists that had no other choice. As you will see, they will act almost independently of Madrid, even if they will send help there and to the north. They will advance towards Aragon, bringing their revolutionary ideas with them. This week, we'll see this Aragonist front get stable. The 7th Lefiniana falls to the anarchist columns, but despite their numerical and material superiority, Colonel Villalba, chief of Barbados Garrison, suggested Durruti not to advance on Zaragoza. Malaga, even if orange, has been isolated since the beginning of the war. The city has seen the struggle between communists and socialists for power, so the effectiveness of the central government was too low, and a committee will be created. In the center of Spain, we have Madrid, the capital, with the government. We don't get tired of repeating that with the coup, the state melted away, so we was under reconstruction, slowly trying to regain the control of the situation. Even if it's not the most accurate, we will color the rest of Republican Spain with the same color as Madrid. Malaga, Valencia and other big chunks of territory could be given different colors. As said before, we could use all the color of the chromatic circle. We have to think about the small villages where a popular form committee took the power, sometimes starting collectivization, sometimes killing the right-wing elements, sometimes both, sometimes protecting private property and people. We will see a very slow process of unification. So here some notes to end the week. The sixth, Hernández Arabia, becomes the facto war minister. You may remember him having a dispute with Primo de Rivera during the dictatorship. Castillo, actual war minister, cannot handle this chaos anymore. Even if the regime narrative will deny this and associate all the committed crimes in Republican territory to the government, this week we saw some efforts to reorganize the DGS, National Security Agency, and the Crime Investigation Department of the Police. The aim was to stop the continuous random killing of supposed right-wing sympathizers in the Republican-held territory. This had a small effect at the beginning and will lead to the creation of the famous and infamous detention and interrogation centers, commonly known as Checas. Also, in this line, this week we saw the death of Josep Gardenas, a well-known and revered Catalan anarchist. He was shot without trial because his practices, robbery and murder, were considered a threat for the new revolutionary order that was being implemented. The CNT, already the 30th of July, made an advertisement in that direction. We started the week with Indalecio's Prieto's words from the 8th of August, in response to the violence seen in Madrid, pledging for it to stop. We will end this week 
with the reply from La Passonaria. We must exterminate them. We must put an end, once and for all, to the threat of a coup d'etat. To military intervention. There has been too much blood split for us to forgive, while the horrendous crimes, the multiple murders committed coldly, sadistically, wave on us like blocks of lead. We must not agree to a single one being pardoned. And if at any time we should feel weakness, then let the memory of our comrades burn alive, of the children murdered, of the men mutilate, be that spur that strengthen us in the hard but necessary work of liquidating the enemies of democracy and the republic. Two popular front leaders opposing views and much more bloodshed will come. If you missed last week's episode, here's the link. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe us. If you enjoyed it, share it. We have to bring light to the history of Spain. If you can take it to school also, do it. If you're able to support us in our Patreon channel, this could be also great. Thanks for your attention, goodbye and salute.